Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. On Now You Know. We're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com. Use our link in the show notes below to get a 30-day free trial to the premium app. And we're also brought to you by bigbattery.com. No matter what you need to power, Big Battery can provide you with the latest battery tech at the best price per kilowatt hour guaranteed. Their batteries are easily installed, require zero maintenance, and they're made right here in the U.S., Pick up yours today at BigBattery.com and use code now you know for 5% off at checkout. All right, we've been saying it for a long time on this channel that all the signs were pointing to Tesla becoming a power grid utility company. Then on Tesla Time News on Monday, we reported on Tesla's announcement that they have indeed launched a virtual power plant or VPP in California that Tesla owners of Powerwalls and Solar will be able to sign up for starting July 22nd. Now, I know that to many people, even people who are smart and watch this channel, this news may seem a bit like, so what? VPP, OMG, NBC, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. And I don't blame you. This is completely new technology, something that has never been seen before. Okay, so how does it work? All right, well, let's start by looking at what happens when you turn on your air conditioner on a super hot day, or what we here in New England call a scorcher. Remember, you are not alone. If you're turning on your air conditioner, then chances are your neighbors are also turning on theirs. And this is on top of all the other stuff that you might have on, like your computer, your lights, your microwave. So just take a look at this chart here from ERCOT. This is Texas's grid operator. As the temperature goes up, so does the demand for electricity. Makes sense. And as you can see from this chart, most of that extra demand on a hot summer day is from residential customers, you and me. So now you turn on your air conditioner, which requires a lot of power, and the electrical grid is now maxed out because, duh, more people are demanding power than usual. Okay, so what can the grid do? Well, uh, option number one, I guess, is they can do nothing, which would basically lower the voltage. You know, you sometimes encounter those sags in your voltage where it's supposed to be 110 and it starts to go to like 108. Um, and appliances don't like this. They like to get exactly what they're looking for. And so this generally is not a solution to the problem. Uh, it's not going to solve anything. So option number two is your electrical utility can shut off parts of the grid. So maybe they decide to just shut off your neighborhood's power for an hour or two during the peak hottest hours of the day. Oh, what can I do today? Yeah, not a great option for the utility because it affects a lot of customers adversely. So are there any other options? Well, the utility can fire up a peaker power plant if it has one at its disposal. So this is like a natural gas or coal fired power plant. Um, and they're specifically designed for peak loads. That's why they're called peaker plants. Um, but doesn't that take a while to spool up and everything? Yeah. Uh, take a look at this chart here. According to the EIA, only about 25% of U.S. power plants can start up within an hour. So what? Utilities have to either sag the voltage or black out the power until those peaker plants come online? Or the utility can fire it up before the peak and try to time it. But that's hard to do. I mean, because it's a moving target with temperature and time and many other factors. So if they start the plant up too early, you may not have needed it. And so you just wasted all that money running a power plant that you didn't need. Well, all those seem like suboptimal options for the utility. Isn't there another option? Well, OK, there's option number four. They could buy some power from somebody. What do you mean buy power from someone? How do you buy power? Uh, yeah, give me uh, two lottery tickets, a pack of smokes and uh, some power. How much would you like? Uh, we got a special on 100 megawatts this week. We got a three pack for $100,000. Yeah, there's over 10,000 power plants in the U.S. that power the grid. Utilities can buy power for short periods of time from neighboring utilities that want to sell access. But it ain't cheap. Utilities can pay up to 10 times more than the average rate for power during peak times because it's supply and demand. Well, I mean, this option sounds good to me. Didn't you just hear me, though? I said it can cost utilities a bundle to have to buy this power. It's it's supply and demand. When the demand is high, supply is low. Prices go through the roof. Yeah, I don't care. Utilities going to pay for it, not me. Uh, that's where you're wrong. You are a ratepayer, right? So whether you see it on this month's bill or not, you will eventually pay for it. I mean, what do you think those utility company executives are going to take a pay cut? But you know what? I, I think you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I mean, so what if occasionally on a really hot day, the grid has a problem for a couple hours? I mean, the system's been working pretty good for decades, so let's not worry about it. Well, to that, I have two responses. The first is that decades ago, and let's go back to my childhood, in fact, in the early 1970s, if we lost power on a hot summer day, it might be annoying, but I don't remember too many businesses run by computers or on the Internet. 
Oh, you know why? Because there were practically no businesses run on computers or in the internet back then. The hardware store that I worked at could still function because we had a manual cash register. Our pricing gun was manual. Our front door was manual. And heck, even our ordering system was this like giant book. It took up like an entire counter. And uh, it's the biggest book you've ever seen. And basically once a week, we would flip through it, jot down what we needed, and we would call the resupply on the phone. So power could go out, we could stay open. So my first point is that until computers and the internet became commonplace, you're right, losing power for a few hours here and there wasn't the end of the world. But today, without power, I can't think of too many things that can still work. I mean, stores, restaurants, offices, home businesses, schools, pretty much everything needs power constantly or else everything stops working. But an even bigger point is that the electrical grid is getting more and more affected by extreme weather. And there's going to be more and more extreme weather. So take a look at this chart from Climate Central, which is an independent organization of scientists and journalists. It shows U.S. power outages from the year 2000 to 2019 that affected more than 50,000 people. Okay, so what are we looking at here? All right, so in gray, that little squiggly line at the bottom, that's non-weather related outages. So think, uh, you know, equipment failures, accidents, things like that. Pretty low numbers and steady, mm -hmm. right? Now in yellow, that line, the one that's going crazy there, that's weather related outages. Wow. I mean, that's wildly unpredictable and it looks like it's not getting any better. No, yeah, it's getting worse. I mean, utilities love predictability, but as the weather becomes less and less predictable, utilities are going to have more and more blackouts. OK, so it is a big problem and it's going to get worse. But isn't this the part of the show where we tell them that Tesla has the answer? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Tesla has come up with three important technologies that can help solve this problem. Their virtual power plant or VPP can help harden the electrical grid. So that means less outages. Right. Can also lower costs. So cheaper electricity for everyone. Right. And make the grid cleaner. So cleaner air and healthier planet for everyone. Exactly. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. It, oh, it sounds good. Kind of sounds a little too good. It, it sounds almost like it's too good to be true. I mean, cheaper, cleaner, better. Why haven't utilities already done this? Well, let's take a look at how Tesla's VPP works. And then I think you're going to see why traditional utility companies were never going to do it themselves. OK, so there are basically just three pieces to a VPP. Solar panels, home batteries, and software. I'm sorry, but what what makes you such an expert at this? <laughs> I mean, you don't work for a utility. Well, I kind of do. You see, eight years ago, Solar City, now Tesla, installed solar panels on my roof. And two years ago, Tesla installed four Powerwall batteries in my house. And then last year, my local utility allowed me to sign up for a program where I can let them, National Grid, control my Powerwalls. National Grid can use power from my batteries whenever they want to help power my neighbor's houses. What? Let's step back. So I have four power walls, right? Each power wall has about 13 kilowatt hours of energy stored. So four times 13 equals 52 kilowatt hours of power stored in my power walls. That's enough power to power the average American home for almost two days. So National Grid powers your neighbor's house for two days? I, I don't get it. Not exactly. OK, so during hot summer days, when, as we showed here, there's a lot of demand for power, National Grid gets to use my battery's power for typically three hours during the hottest part of the day. That 52 kilowatt hours that I have is enough to offset a lot of air conditioners in the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, let's do the math. A typical window air conditioner uses between 500 and 1500 watts of power. Let's say 1000 watts as average. So if National Grid uses your battery for, say, three hours, those 52 kilowatt hours could power 17 of your neighbor's window air conditioners. Exactly. So for up to 60 days in the summer and up to five days in the winter, National Grid typically draws down the power from my batteries. And it's not just your batteries. Exactly. If it were just my batteries, then I'd only be helping reduce demand by about 17 households. But I'm not the only one with power walls around here. Now, I tried to find out how many people are part of the National Grid Connected Solutions program in my area. And I did find a preliminary report for the first year of the program, which was 2019, when it appears that there were only 65 of us. According to this report, Massachusetts was the first state to officially incorporate what's called behind the meter battery storage, as it's called. Um, now it's two years later, and I'm sure there's way more of us battery owners in the program, and it's actually expanded to seven more states. But 
yeah, that's the problem. I don't know exactly how many of us there are. And this leads us to Tesla's new VPP program that they just announced in California. Now, we don't know much about that yet either. We don't know how many Powerwall owners will sign up. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but other than you being a nice guy, why did you let National Grid use your power walls? You're right. It's not just because I'm a nice guy. It's because National Grid is paying me to use my power walls. Mm, how much did they pay? Well, I was part of the daily dispatch program and the winter targeted dispatch program. So you can see here, you can earn some decent bucks. Does that say $225 per kilowatt? Yep. So... Yeah, I earned over $2,000 last summer just letting them use my power walls, and I barely even noticed that they used them. Yeah, you can see some screenshots here that uh, I have of my Tesla app, which shows basically whenever, you know, what's going on with my system, whenever the battery is being used or whenever it's being powered up. And um, I would never notice anything going on in the house, but every now and then I'd look at my app and I'd be like, oh, you know what? I'm helping my neighbors right now. So the power walls not only give you backup power in the case of a blackout, but they also allow you to store your own power that you generate on your roof to use and now you're able to make money from the grid so not only were you saving a bunch of money now you're m actually making money wow i was a mini power plant so i mean like i was saying we don't know how many power wall owners will sign up or what the incentive will be or even how it's going to be managed yeah i mean will tesla aggregate all the power and then sell it as a block to say pg e when the prices are high enough right we don't know if tesla will use its auto bidder ai software to monitor the grid and bid on selling blocks of power to the utility oh sorry or... wait, wait, wait. what's you what's auto bidder again right auto bidder is this really cool software that tesla developed that does two things one, it aggregates all the data from all the solar and power wall users. Using AI, it learns and then predicts when there will be excess power at each home with the power wall and solar panels. It has to know about all sorts of things like weather and daily energy usage patterns. It has to know that like you come home at six and you plug in your car, it like has to learn all that stuff, which up until now, how would you even begin to do this without AI? You'd have a big department full of people like, oh, okay, it's six o'clock. Charlie's uh, solar system is about to go online. Like you did, there's no way you'd no be able way. to manage that exactly. on a daily basis. Exactly, because I mean, we're talking thousands of people. So then the next thing that AutoBidder software does is it monitors the electrical grid and predicts when it will need power. Oh, I see. So it's like Thursday at 11 a.m., for instance, and AutoBidder is watching all of these Tesla homes that are part of the VPP, and it predicts there'll be excess solar power coming up at noon. Right. And it's watching the Southern California electrical grid, and it predicts that at noon, there's going to be a deficit of, say, 100 megawatts of power needed to power all those air conditioners going online. AutoBidder can then offer PG&E 100 megawatts of power at some price to fill their need. But how does it work? I mean, how does Auto Bitter deliver all that power to all the right houses? Yeah, I, I always got stuck at that, too. I'm like, I understand AI kind of and I understand this, but like, how does it control all the houses? But here's the cool part that nobody really gets until you get a power wall. So when power walls are installed in your house, the power walls have the hardware, the interconnect switches inside them to take your house on and off the grid in milliseconds. So fast that when it switches, you can't even tell. Right. I mean, I remember we were doing a, a show right here and I heard a tree fall and it knocked out the power. The You didn't notice anything really change. And we kept recording the show. We walked out outside later on and the wire to our house was cut by a big tree that came down. And it does this all the time. Like as soon as it, it notices anything weird in what's coming in from the grid, it'll cut us offline instantly for yep. like five minutes, then it'll check the grid, okay, everything was fine. But I mean, that can be protecting your house from weird you know, surges and stuff like that. All of this, it, it happens in milliseconds and you don't notice any difference. Yeah, it really is amazing. I mean, you just mentioned, um, you know, if there is a power sag, like if the voltage does drop, yeah, it takes you offline, keeps giving you 110 volts, um, even while your neighbors might be getting really bad power. And by bad, I mean, it can be noisy power. Like if something is going on in the grid, um, you don't notice it because you're not watching the waveform, but like it can be getting really choppy and your power wall just levels it all out for your house. You don't even notice it. And that's what I mean by like until you get one, you don't really know what you just think it's a box. Right. So since AutoBidder is communicating with your power walls through an internet connection, AutoBidder can say, okay, Zach's power walls, at exactly 12.01 p.m., you're going to start feeding power back onto the grid until, let's say, 12.30 p.m. I see. And in fact, it, it wouldn't even have to say until 12.30. It could say until right now. 
Right. It gave me, oh, uh, the, 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 the price just changed. Quick. <laughs> you're, you're now back online. You're, right. you know, uh, or, hey, the, the price of electricity just dropped. PG&E is making way more. They're, they're paying to get rid of their electricity. Let's start charging up these batteries that I have under my exactly. wings. I mean, and PG&E doesn't have many batteries. Um, and the batteries that they do have <laughs> are from Tesla. Um, <laughs> that is the really exciting part about a VPP is that it's, it's managing power in a way that we've never been able to manage power before. Yeah, I mean, normally you think of a power plant as this one big building somewhere controlled by a bunch of guys with hard hats. Now we're talking about my house is part of this virtual power plant. There's no hard hats here. There's no guys walking around with clipboards. Mm -hmm. It's all just software controlling it. And it, that's why it seems so unreal because it's like, wait a minute, your house is being controlled by Tesla? Right. So imagine at 1201, the grid all of a sudden gets a bunch of power just as it was needing it for all those air conditioners to start turning on and the crisis is averted. And unlike a slow peaker plant that can take minutes, if not hours to ramp up, Tesla's VPP can do this in milliseconds. Exactly. Tesla's VPP turns your solar panel covered house into a mini power plant. Now couple your house with dozens, hundreds, thousands of other solar and battery houses and you have... A new power plant that you didn't have to build, that doesn't pollute, and that helps stabilize the grid. Now, we've been predicting this for years, and it's now coming true. Yeah, a lot of people made fun of us when we came out with our previous videos saying like, what are you guys talking about? Tesla's never going to do this. Right. And now they're doing it. So now how big a virtual power plant are we talking about here? I mean, the average natural gas peaker plant is around 500 megawatts. So how many homes would need to be a part of a VPP to equal one traditional peaker plant? Well, let's say that the average Tesla Powerwall household has two Powerwalls. There might be some with one, there might be some with three or four, but let's say the average is two. So that's 26 kilowatt hours of battery storage. And let's say that the average solar panel system that Tesla installs is five kilowatts, which is the average here in America. Okay, so basically we take 500 million watts, which is 500 megawatts, um, and what do we divide it by? Well, if you needed that 500 megawatts for just one hour, we could divide it by the 26 kilowatts of the average Powerwall system. But let's make it last for four hours, which is kind of an industry standard use case. And that's for battery systems. Like right. they, they need the the megawattage for four hours. Right. Because that's typically what they need blocks of time. That's for. like the biggest block you'd ever need it for. Okay. So 26 kilowatt hours is the average amount of power wall battery storage per home. Let's divide that by four. So we get 6.5 uh, kilowatts. Right. So each home can deliver 6.5 kilowatts an hour for four hours. Okay, so we divide 500 million watts by 6.5 kilowatts and we get 76,923 homes needed. So as of May of this year, Tesla had installed about 200,000 power walls around the world. So you can think of that as about a peaker plant, maybe a little bit more than a peaker plant. And we just learned from Elon testifying during that lawsuit in Delaware last week that Tesla expects to deliver another 30 to 35,000 this quarter. Tesla actually has orders for 80,000 power walls, but chip shortages are limiting production. So I don't expect to see 500 megawatt numbers coming out of Tesla's Southern California VPP to start. But you can see that as more households join the VPP, Tesla can grow the capacity of this VPP every day as they install more solar panels, more solar roofs and more power walls. And that's kind of what I wanted to get at here. When you build a power plant, that's it. Whatever you built, like that's what it's going to pu put out. But with a VPP, if Charlie adds solar and a power wall, you can just add them to your VPP. And Tesla isn't paying for that extra capacity. Right. Because Charlie actually gets the benefit of having it would be like if you took a, you know, a peaker plant and you were able to like break it into a bunch of pieces and you'd be like, here, have a piece of a power plant. And right. instead of it just being a valve that would just like sit on your desk and be like, Harold, what is that? Oh, it's a part of a peaker plant. You know, it, that wouldn't help you. Right. Having a small piece of a virtual power plant means that when, it, you know, the grid goes offline, uh, a tree comes and cuts down your power, you still have solar, which can go into your battery pack, which can power your house pretty much indefinitely. Yeah. The utilities will be paying Tesla for this power because Tesla is a virtual power plant and utilities pay power plants for power. So then Tesla will be getting this money which will in turn pay Powerwall and solar customers. Exactly, which makes solar and Powerwalls a more enticing uh, 
product for people to buy, which means more and more people will be getting solar and power walls. And I just want to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. There was an assembly woman in California who wanted to propose a bill that would kill net metering. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Because utilities see this coming and they're like, how can we stop people from doing this? Don't let them have net meters. Net meters basically allow you to either have power flow into your house or out of your house back to the grid. And you get paid if power goes out of your house. Right. And the utilities hate this. Right, because you become a utility. Right. And the only reason that net metering exists is because of laws. Right. Um, as soon as Tesla becomes a utility and essentially they are a virtual power plant and they can be buying and selling the power intelligently and storing it in batteries, customers aren't necessarily going to have to rely on net metering in order to make money. Now, it is important that the law stay in place, uh, net metering specifically, but it gives a whole bunch more clout exactly. to people who want net metering to exist because there are no utilities that want net metering to exist. No, that's a really good point. Right now, when utilities say something to legislatures, most people are like, I don't know, whatever the utility wants. I, I don't I don't get it, how right. it works. When you become a part of the utility and you now understand what these laws are about, you're going to be going, wait, hang on. What did you just say? No, I don't agree with that, uh, Assemblywoman. I don't want that bill passed. And now you're going to have a utility company, Tesla's virtual power plant that can go and say, hey, actually, no, we do want to keep net metering. Right. And we're a we're actually a big uh, utility. So you better listen to us. Yeah. And there are so many other things that utilities are doing behind the scenes. We don't talk about them that much, like limiting the amount of solar you can put on your house. Yep. Even if you have the real estate, even if you have, uh, you know, there aren't trees blocking it. Utilities can prevent you from putting solar on your house because they can go, that's too much solar for you. They did it to us. I mean, back in 2013, right before we got our electric cars, we said, we're going to be getting an electric car soon. So we're going to need more than our bills show. And they're like, nope, you can only get what your bill shows. I'm like, but we're getting an electric car. And they're limiting us. Uh, there's a guy in our town who has twenty a 20 kilowatt system on his house. He doesn't have a gigantic house or anything. He just has covered his entire roof in solar. He's able to constantly have more power generated from his house than he needs, which is exactly what a VPP would want. Right. And that's why he it took him over a year to fight the utility to get that extra solar on his roof because he was like, I'm going to be getting two Teslas. Yeah, this is truly going to be a game changer. Tesla's VPP is going to speed up the transition to sustainable energy. This totally fits Tesla's mission. But now I hear what the naysayers are saying. You forgot one thing there, you two Elon fanboys. This whole plan of yours relies on batteries, lots of them. Tesla can barely make enough batteries for its cars. How will it be able to make enough power walls to blanket the earth? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. But remember, each Tesla electric car is the equivalent of five or six power walls. So what? Well, for many hours of the day, those electric cars with really big batteries in them are plugged into a charger. Oh, right. And we did a whole episode on V2G and how with just one piece of hardware, Tesla will be able to turn on a vehicle to grid, allowing cars to power the grid. Exactly. To get that 500 megawatt power plant that we just talked about, you'd only need 26,000 Model 3s or Ys as opposed to 76,000 homes. And Tesla already has over a million cars on the road. That's equivalent to over 37 power plants already. So you see, we just got our first glimpse of Tesla's first U.S.-based VPP. Don't be surprised when Tesla announces vehicle to grid as part of its VPP. Now, I know, again, we're going to get lots of comments of like, well, but you need special hardware and I don't think it can happen. Blah, blah, blah. It's not hard to do. It just needs a bit of hardware at your house. And then basically your mobile battery becomes a vehicle to grid battery. And having a VPP unlocks the incentive for doing it. I mean, Tesla right. didn't have any reason to put the proper, you know, diodes or chips in your car to make, uh, you know, bi-directional charging happen. But now with the VPP, if they can go, hey, you know, we, we could really expand our VPP if all these cars um, could be on the network. Yeah, it would be very incentivizing. The other point would be more charging stations. Tesla already has some uh, incentive programs where uh, companies can install chargers at their place of business. It's usually a hassle for that business because they have to pay for the installation, although they get the chargers for free. If there was more of an incentive for Tesla to install these chargers, maybe they could offer a little bit more money. And this would allow people to drive to work, plug in their cars, leave them plugged in. And then at noon, you know, when uh, AC is 
pumping as hard as it can and the grid needs more power, draw down a little bit of your battery, not all of it, draw down a little bit. And then towards the end of the day, five o'clock or whatever, when most of that demand diminishes, charge it right back up and you drive home with a full battery. Everybody wins. Yeah. I mean, as the grid gets more and more unstable with extreme weather, more and more people are going to want a solution. If we look at the Ford F-150 Lightning that just came out, it has vehicle to grid. One of their selling points was put in this special box that Ford will install for you and you can plug your F-150 into your house, power your house for up to three days during a blackout. Now, there's probably does not allow you to interconnect to the grid because their box probably is not as sophisticated as a power wall. And that's where I think a lot of people are just like, well, it'll just do the job of a backup generator. And that's great. We're going one step further here or a whole lot steps further here, being able to store power in your cars and then use that on a grid just unlock so many things. And I think the stopping point for so many people is just that this seems like science fiction. Mm -hmm. This seems like well, this can't happen for 40 years. It's happening now. The technology is here. It's actually not that complicated, but it does need to be unlocked with things like AI. And I think most of us, when we talk about AI, are just like, I don't know. I don't know what AI does. I don't know how it works. Think of it as just basically a room full of guys with spreadsheets, right? Yeah. I mean, it's able to do this amazing amount of data processing and predictability that up until this point was just not possible. And the other point here, too, is that we do spend a lot of money on just backup. Yep. You go look at any municipal building, any school, any office building, there is going to be a huge backup generator. Go around the back of the building yep. or someplace, you know, the, the less desirable areas around the building. You are going to see probably a fenced off area mm -hmm. with a gravel thing around it. And there's going to be this big box and it's probably going to say Kohler on the side of it. And it's a giant generator yep. just to power the backup system of the building. Right. Because as we talked about, these buildings cannot lose power. If you're leasing a big office building, you're paying that landlord a lot of money to make sure that your computers will never lose power. And so they sit there for months, years at a time without being used. They have to be serviced and maintained all so that for a few minutes sometime, they'll turn on and save the day. And you're right. They cost a lot of money. They're big and ugly. And they're usually powered by natural gas or diesel. And they're just sitting there and you don't see them. As soon as you start seeing them, though, you it's like it, you'll just start seeing them everywhere. And you have to understand how much these systems cost and they are not cheap to maintain. It's not like they just sit there. There's an engine in there. Right. Anyone who's ever tried to start up their lawnmower after a, you know, a season, uh, after a winter knows that it's like that thing doesn't really want to sit there and just accumulate gunk in its cylinders right. and stuff like that. And again, people will spend that kind of money on their own homes, on yeah. smaller uh, generators. I just got the notice from my generator maintenance company. It says, uh, hey, Zach, you got to spend another 250 bucks this year to maintain your generator to make sure it'll start for you. And that's just basically because it's a little gas engine and they've got to, you know, change out a couple filters and things. I got to spend that every year if I want that thing to start up when I need it. And that's what I'm saying. This is the alternative to that. And it has so many other benefits. I mean, it would be one thing if it was like, buy this box and it'll do the same thing as the generator, um, but you don't have to maintenance it. People would go, oh, really? I'm very interested in this box that you're going to sell me. Now, if you can go, hey, buy this box, sometimes you're going to be making money from the, you know, you know how you pay your electrical grid? Oh, yeah, I know I have to pay my electrical bill. Well, what if some you know months it was negative? You were making the money. So here's the little hint. You watch till the end of the video. I think you deserve it. Yeah. Um, in the early stages of this, you're going to get paid the most amount of money. So you just heard from me, I get checks from my utility for thousands of dollars. That's not going to happen forever. No. As more and more people get batteries, the value will go down. But in the early days, it's really high because the utilities are going, whoa, this is way cheaper for us than having to go buy the power or, or do something else. So my little hint to you guys is if you're on the fence about getting power walls in your area and solar, Maybe factor this in because it's probably coming to your neighborhood soon uh, because, you know, seven states now have it. And so you could be getting checks for hundreds or thousands of dollars for letting them use your power walls. Yeah. And I'm excited to see what Tesla's VPP is going to be offering uh, for incentives as well. I mean, 
you, they're going to be using your battery system that essentially they're only selling right now as like a backup or if uh, there's, you know, differential in pricing, you know, you could be making money that way. But for the lion's share of most people who are buying power walls, they're just buying them for backup. And right. now you're going to be able to use that for something other than arguably the one use that most people bought it for. So if you join this VPP in Southern California on July 22nd, please share with us uh, what the deal is. We'd love to see like what kind of money per kilowatt can you get paid for letting them use your batteries? And I mean, I really think that this is going to see a dramatic change in the way that we think about solar. I think that for a lot of people, uh, they wanted solar because they knew it was the right thing to do in terms of like the planet. Um, but the utilities just did not want you to stop being their customer. It was like, well, we don't want you to slow down there, sonny boy. We don't. We want you to keep paying us money every month. So they would fight. They fought tooth and nail in every single state, in every single municipality to try and prevent people from putting solar on the roofs because they would lose out on that revenue. Now having Tesla as this VPP, as this utility, they can go out and fight. They can say, uh, yeah, Joe should have as much solar on his roof as he can possibly fit. Yes, that pine tree, you know, either needs to come down or we're not going to put solar on this particular section because it just doesn't make economic sense. But there's no reason not to pack 12 kilowatts on his roof. That is going to cover more than the electricity than he generates. What happens when half of the people in the United States are generating more power than they use? Suddenly, what do we need all this other generation for? Yeah, I mean, you might be hearing us speak right now and thinking, well, this is just going to offset a couple peaker plants and that's great news. No, this is going to become the power for this nation and hopefully for the world. And if you're watching this and you're like, well, how come I don't hear analysts talking about this stock analysts who watch Tesla closely? Yeah, they're always wrong. They're always behind. They're always just talking about how many cars are they going to sell this quarter? They don't get Tesla energy. It just goes over their head. Batteries and stuff, they're just, uh, maybe they, you know, count how many power walls are sold. We're talking about something where Tesla is going to repeat what it did in the car business. Look at when we started the show, if we had told you that Tesla would have 71% of the electric car market in the US, you would have said we were crazy. And you would have said, what are electric cars? <laughs> right. Because they pioneered that entire industry. Now go to the utility industry. Where's their competition? Who do you hear is doing exactly what they're doing? No one. So what do you think is going to happen in a few years when Tesla becomes the number one market leader in this market? Why do you think they bought Solar City? It was the number one solar provider in the country because Elon gets it. He doesn't look at just quarter, quarter, quarter. He looks at year, decade. He looking, He's looking out long term because he sees what's going to happen. And he knew that if you could get solar on enough roofs, you would become a power plant. And add this on to Tesla's other products, such as uh, power packs and mega packs. And it's not going to be that hard for them to transition to a large energy provider. Yeah. Who else is making solar roofs and installing them right now? Right. The one thing that most people, after they've heard all of the information and how much money they would save, the one thing that would stop a solar installation is usually one person in the household or both I going, I don't like solar panels. I they don't look like, kind of ugly. I don't like the look of it. That's the one thing. And as soon as you can go, oh, well, honey, these panels are going to last longer, look great, um, and we're not going to need to replace them. They're going to last a lifetime. Right. It's, be it's become our roof. Right. Uh, that's that's going to be the nail in the coffin, because I think that a lot of people can get the panels on the roof. I think that they look fine for me. I know that other people disagree. So if if just imagine if all the roofs in this country were covered with solar, there wouldn't be too much extra power that we would need to generate. And uh, we've got the freaking land for it. It goes back to first principles. Yeah. When you start talking about this, you're inevitably going to have an uncle over in the corner of the room who's going to argue and well, say, Well, actually, our solar is bad for the grid and you can't have batteries in it. You need so many batteries to stuck up to the sky and we'd cover and, the whole world in solar panels. And, so, uh, and let's go to that battery argument for a second. Yeah. Let's say that Uncle Joe there over there in the corner in his Barca lounger is right and we can't make enough batteries fast enough. Uh, we've talked talked about on the show and will continue to that there's other ways to store power besides these little lithium batteries you can store it in a cryo battery which is just liquid oxygen or you can store it in a hole in the ground 
You can store it in a tower that you build. Like you can store it so many different ways and they're not that expensive. In fact, they're cheaper than what we're doing now. So that's what's going to happen. There's going to be storage popping up all over the place. It won't just be power walls. And we're going to solve this problem. We're going to store solar during sunny days. We're going to store wind during windy days. And we're going to have all the power we need. And there's going to be so many advances in geothermal systems that can reduce the amount of power that we need to draw as a nation um, that you could know, make a huge difference. You know, I'm actually looking forward to the day that I'm on my deathbed. On that day, what I would like you to do is take out this video and play it for me as I slowly drift off. <laughs> into the great unknown, because I am right. I know I'm right about what's gonna happen in this country. And I know that we're gonna have an awesome energy future. And as we have more and more cheap energy, it's gonna become practically free. We're gonna be able to do more and more. That is what's going to unlock so much more about technology is cheap or free energy. Right. And you know, it gets into this whole like, oh, but you gotta recycle the batteries. The cheaper electricity gets. The easier it is to recycle the batteries, the easier it is to make right. more solar panels with using even less carbon dioxide per solar panel. Exactly. It, it makes everything greener. It's just the the more you get, the better everything gets. And yeah, you could recycle almost anything if you have enough energy to do it. Right now, when you roof your house, you don't even think about it. You just hire a roofing company, you pick out some color and they roof your house, whether it's rubber, whether it's asphalt, whether it's steel, right? You don't think about it. Why? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. In the very near future, you'll call up the roofing company and they'll be like, what style of solar roof do you want? Right. How much power do you want to be generating? How right. much money do you want to be saving? How much do you want to be investing now? Do you want to be doing a power purchase agreement? There's so many different things that are going to change in the future about how we live in houses, which are these things that have not changed for hundreds of years. And- the three things we just talked about with this VPP is what unlocks all of this. The auto bidder software, the solar, and the batteries. Those three seemingly simple and unconnected things unlock this future power abundance that we're gonna have. And it will be green. That is the best part, is that we're not talking about, you know, building a bunch of, you know, coal power plants and, you know, ash ponds and all sorts of awful stuff. It's going to be solar, it's going to be wind, it's going to be batteries. And Elon said this so many times. He said, Tesla Energy is going to surpass the value of the automaker side of the company. And just for too many of us, we're just like, I don't even know what that means, so I'm not even gonna think about it. Well, think about it. Look at the stock price today. If Tesla Energy, which is still tiny compared to the auto part, starts to blow up, think about where the stock price is going to go. Because think of all of the different industries that this is going to disrupt. It's going to disrupt oil industries. It's going to disrupt the utility industries. Add all of those together. In fact, we did an episode called Elon the Disruptor where we, we, we did a added, series. Yeah, we did an entire series where we talked about this. It is going to absolutely dominate. It is going because it's going to have the cheapest electricity at all times. Now, if you're watching this and you're like, this, I mean, is exciting. I want to learn more. We did an entire series, Elon the Disruptor series. Not many people watched it, I think, because it did go over most people's heads and it seemed too far fetched. But one of our arguments in that series was for a VPP and it's now coming true. So I urge you, go check it out right here because we walk through all of the different industries that he's going to disrupt. So thank you so much for watching this episode of In Depth. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week on Friday for another episode. We'll see you on Monday for Tesla Time News. So be sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so that way you don't miss any of them. We'll see you next week. Now you know. know.